Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, August 9th, 2020. I invite you to download the bulletin for the service. Uh, it can be found at the link uh, in the description below this video on YouTube and on Facebook, or you can head to our website, www.centralpresspb.com. At, at the top, excuse me, click the uh, publications link. Uh, that will take you to the bulletin and newsletters. If you scroll down, you will find today's date. Click that and feel free to print that. It is in a more printable um, fashion uh, the last few weeks. Um, now that you've downloaded and prepared for today's worship service, I ask that you turn your attention to the announcements found on the back of the bulletin. Uh, the session has decided to continue online services for the month of August. Uh, we will reevaluate the situ situation at the end of the month. Archives for our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each can be found on our website, um, which where you can also find online giving is now available. Uh, click the Donate Now link. Uh, we take credit cards, debit cards, and checks. You can also set up a recurring donation on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Let us prepare to worship God. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for it, us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first in unison, using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. O oh God, when trials beset us, it is natural to fear. Called to be courageous, we found, find our faith lacking. When, we, when asked to take risks, we confess our complacency. By ignoring injustice, we hope that it will subside. You have shown us how you are a God to be trusted. Leading your people, you have stayed by their side. Even Christ overcame his enemies as he hung on the cross. Forgive our reluctance to believe in your guidance and grant us the wisdom to seek refuge in Christ. And now silently... Amen. As people born of the water and the spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now for this week's sermon, right before our very eyes. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our first reading this morning comes from the 105th Psalm, beginning with verse 1 and proceeding through verse 6. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. And our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 14th, or in the 14th chapter at verse 22, 
and proceeding through verse 33. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, <clears throat> Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worship him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. There is an old story that has often been told and retold, especially in Eastern Orthodox churches. According to the tale, a devout abbot from a monastery decided to take a prolonged spiritual retreat in a small cabin located on a remote island in the middle of a large lake. He told his fellow monks that he wanted to spend his days in prayer so as to grow closer to God. And for six months, he remained on that island with no other person either seeing him or hearing from him in all that time. But then, one day, as two monks were standing near the shore soaking up some sunshine, they could see in the distance a figure moving toward them. It was the abbot. He was walking on the water, coming toward the shore. After the abbot passed by these two monks and continued on to the monastery, one of the monks turned to the other and said, All those months in prayer, and the abbot is as stingy as ever. Doesn't he know the ferry from the island only costs 25 cents? All humor aside, I think that tale points to an important reality that we sometimes miss the significance of something right before our very eyes. It's there for anyone to see, but for some reason we just don't notice. Or as the old cliche goes, we can't see the forest for the trees. And a case in point is the glory of God that is ever before us. We are so accustomed to seeing the beauty of creation that we sometimes fell to marvel at how intricately and painstakingly we are all designed, be it the gossamer wings of a butterfly or the way the morning sun seems to set the world on fire with color or the way one season gives way to another or the way even our cells work together in the human body. The glory of God is ever before us. A friend of mine once gave me a book entitled Your Inner Fish, 
And this book's premise is a scientific examination of a recently discovered link in the evolutionary chain. The really intriguing aspect about the discovery of the fossilized remains of this particular, particular fish about which the book was written is that it seems to be the missing link between water-dwelling animals and land-dwelling animals. And the reason why this is important, the author asserted, is that from this point forward in time, every vertebrate dwelling on Earth shares similar characteristics in their arms and hands. The upper arm is one large bone connected to two smaller bones in the forearm at the elbow. Then there are a series of smaller bones gathered together at the wrist before the bones branch out to form fingers. And the theory that is postulated is that this common pattern began with this particular fish. The first fish known to have exhibited this pattern in the structure of its fins. Hence the title of the book, Your Inner Fish. And as I read that book, it made me have an even deeper appreciation of the attention to detail our God exhibited in, incre in creating all of us. How alike we really are. One of the beautiful things about the story of creation recorded in scripture is the fact that humanity from the very beginning is linked to all other creatures. We are created in God's image to be stewards and caretakers of creation. Creation was repeatedly pronounced good in God's estimation long before humans were created, but with the arrival of humans, someone to tend and care for all that God had made, God pronounced creation very good. That truth is right before our very eyes. But we often fail to see it because we become too focused on filling the earth and subduing it. Or take our reading from the 105th Psalm this morning. It says, remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has ordered, uttered. The Psalm itself is given the title, God's Faithfulness to Israel. And it goes on to celebrate God's faithfulness to Israel throughout its 45 verses. It speaks of the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. It sings of God's faithful providence through Joseph. It reaches a crescendo as it praises God for leading the people out of slavery in Egypt and establishes them in the very land that God had promised to give them. The story of God's faithfulness spanning from the book of Genesis through the book of Joshua is neatly summed up in the 45 verses of this psalm. God's enduring commitment to God's people is celebrated in song and is condensed in much the same way that our faith is condensed and summarized in the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed. And yet, too often the people of Israel forgot God's faithfulness and bowed down to idols. We do too. This gracious, faithful, providential God is always in our midst, and yet much of Israel's and our history is a sad and tragic story of how we search for someone or something to fill that innate sense of longing, that God-shaped hole in each of us, because our eyes fail to notice the one who is right before our very eyes. And I believe that this is the issue behind our reading from Matthew this morning as well. Traditionally, this passage has been interpreted as Jesus standing out on the stormy seas of life and beckoning us to step out in faith, to enter the chaos and confusion in our midst and do so with courage and a firm resolve. Hence, Peter initially does the right thing, but when he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he sinks like a stone. 
And the moral of the story in such an interpretation is that we should keep our attention on our Lord and not worry about how impossible the tasks our Lord calls us to perform really are. And I'll admit there is much to be said about heeding our Lord's call and walking where he walks without fear or reservation. As we were fond of saying in seminary, that'll preach. But I don't think that that is the only interpretation of this passage. As is always the case when interpreting the scriptures, context is key. And the events in this morning's passage follow immediately on the heels of Jesus' miracle of feeding the multitude with five loaves and two fish. This miracle was indicative of what Jesus had been teaching about the kingdom of heaven, namely that something grand and glorious results from very small and seemingly insignificant beginnings. Equally telling about this miracle is the long-standing history of God's ability and willingness to use our own brokenness to be a blessing to others, which we examined last week. So as Jesus dismisses the crowd, he sends his disciples ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Then he goes off to spend some time in prayer. But then we read that ominous detail. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. A more literal translation of the Greek there is that instead of being battered by the waves, the boat was being tortured or torn apart by the waves. Matthew's word choice is interesting. Could this in fact be a message to a community of faith that was enduring persecution? The possibility is there, but we need not be experiencing persecution for us to know what it is like to struggle and strive in the face of hardship and feel like we are making no progress whatsoever. But note what happens next in the story. Matthew reports that early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. Now, our modern enlightened minds tend to get sidetracked by whether or not this was possible. After all, Jesus is defying all the laws of physics. But the minds of Jesus' disciples would have focused more on the one who overcomes the power of chaos and confusion, often represented in the Bible by water. In fact, in the Old Testament, the only scriptures Jesus and his disciples would have had only God walks on the sea. So when Jesus walking toward his beaten and beleaguered disciples, he was saying more than one might initially think. He was bearing witness to his ability to overcome chaos and confusion. And lest any one of his disciples or us miss what was so obviously before their very eyes, Jesus went on to say to his disciples, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. But again, our English translations do not fully capture the meaning of the Greek. The Greek there simply says, I am. I am. As in God's response to Moses' question about God's name at the burning bush, I am who I am. I am, says Jesus, the one who Matthew reports will be called Emmanuel, God with us. God is in the midst of the chaos and the confusion, the trials and the tribulations. Moreover, with each step he takes, our Lord is literally moving closer to his disciples in the storm, and we can almost hear the words of the 105th Psalm pulsing in the background. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. If ever there were a time when the comforting news of God's abiding presence in our lives was right before the disciples' very eyes, this would be it. 
If ever there were reason enough to take heart and have no fear, this would be it. But Peter wasn't so sure. And before we judge Peter too harshly, we should bear in mind that we all bear a striking resemblance to him in our own lives. I love how Barbara Brown Taylor summed up the portrait of Peter in her sermon, Saved by Doubt. She writes, there is something so sincere about him and so achingly familiar. He is full of faith one minute, and full of doubt the next, riding high on his confidence in Jesus one moment and lying in the dirt the next. He's not a fake. Through all his ups and downs, all his great moments and his awful ones, Peter's heart is on his sleeve. What you see is what you get with him. An impetuous, outspoken man who both loves Jesus and lets him down who richly deserves Jesus' judgment, but who also receives his grace. We could easily insert our own names in place of Peter's, and the same could be said for each one of us. And in spite of the overwhelming evidence before his very eyes, Peter is not sure it is the Lord who is drawing near. So he takes the initiative. Notice it is his idea, not the Lord's, to get out of the boat. If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. If. In that one word, Peter expresses his need and his desire for proof. As if Jesus walking on the water and revealing his identity with the words, I am, were not enough, Peter, Peter needed further assurance. That word, if, appears in other places in Matthew in reference to Christ's identity. While being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus hears the word three times from the lips of Satan, if you are the Son of God then do this. It happens again as Jesus is dying on the cross when scoffers at the foot of the cross yell out, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. If you are who you say you are, then make me do something grand and impossible like walking on the water, says Peter. Prove it. And so, when Jesus asks Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Maybe the issue is not that Peter sank like a stone, but that he wanted to get out of the boat at all. Sometimes it's enough just to be in the boat, recognizing our Lord's presence among us, trusting and believing that the winds and waves or the trials and tribulations that besail us, uh, assail us and besiege us will not overcome us. Sometimes remaining faithful simply means continuing to row the boat in the midst of the storm while worshiping the Son of God in our midst. Perhaps that is the test of faith, not whether or not we can walk on water like our Lord, but whether or not we can endure when things get really rough. Because the storms of life will always rage around us. The waves of uncertainty will indeed toss us about as we stare into an uncertain future but our Lord is always right before our very eyes. What more do we need in order to take heart and not be afraid to continue rowing the boat? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me 
and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and our offerings. Again, this week, these tithes and offerings will be taken electronically. If you head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, you can click the Donate Now link at the top right-hand corner uh, and uh, make your tithes that way. If you prefer, you may also mail your tithes into the church. Our address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns, uh, which where there were a few uh, we uh, proceeded to receive via our Facebook group. If you'd like to uh, join our Facebook Messenger group with our prayers and concerns each week, uh, please contact us via social media, and uh, we will make sure you get added to that group. Uh, this week, we were asked to pray for Kara and Kyle Taylor, uh, Thomas Porter, who is Dana Neal's father, uh, continued prayers for Adam Vick on his um, surgery recovery, uh, continued prayers for Brad Von Tunglin as he continues to deal with illness, um, pray for the Yanez and Mendoza families. They lost um, the Mrs. Yanez to coronavirus uh, several days ago. Uh, please continue to uh, pray for Linda Maynard and Anne's, Anne Hollingsworth, who had an um, accident. I believe she had a fall this week. And um, she's a, both of uh, those ladies are friends of the church. Uh, we also ask that you continue to pray for those who are on the front lines fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we continue to ask that you keep those families, including the Yanas and Mendoza families, in your prayers for uh, those who lost loved ones. Uh, we also continue to ask uh, for prayer that uh, we find a cure for this horrible disease or a um, vaccine uh, as soon as possible so we may return to meeting in person again. Because uh, we, uh, I know everyone, I've, been, I've spoken to several people of the congregation the last couple weeks, and they're all very anxious to come back uh, to in-person worship. Uh, the session just wants to make sure that we're uh, safe when we do it. Uh, please also continue to uh, keep our nation and our world in these troubled times in your prayers as well. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask that you be uh, keep your care and, and um, healing power over Mr. Mendoza, Ms. Uh, Hollingsworth, um, Mr. Vic, uh, Mr. Von Tunglin, Ms. Maynard. Uh, please let those who are um, have uh, unspoken prayer requests, please let those be answered. Please be with those who have lost loved ones to the coronavirus, including the Yanez and uh, and Mendoza families. Uh, please keep those who are on the front lines in your protection and care. Uh, please allow those who are seeking to find a cure, the wisdom and knowledge to do so. Please be with our nation and our world. 
who need you now more than ever. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and, and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Today, King, today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.